as rational as possible here. I'm not somebody who's uh, who's necessarily into the afterlife or spirits or touchy feely or anything. But I get the sense. I honestly sense that when they wear those black mamba uniforms. The spirit of Kobe is in that building. I, I, I know it sounds insane. I know I sound like a, you know, uh, one of those guys that's hosting a seance. But I wanted to ask you about it anyway. Just because it seems to me, like Frank Vogel in the huddle said in your piece, hey, you guys are all wearing the jersey. You're all shot makers tonight. Have that confidence. Do you sense there is some type of spirit of Kobe that is following this team around? Yeah, John, and I don't know if it's so much, you know, Kobe having his, his spirit visit us down here in Orlando, but there are some parallels here that are, quite frankly, eerie. The fact that you know, Kobe won in Orlando in 2009, his fourth championship, taking out Denver in the conference finals. Um, right. You know, there would be a similar path that, that LeBron's trying to go down right here. Let me tell you what this fourth title would mean for LeBron. That all of the people that never saw Michael Jordan play will be validated in their mind that LeBron is the greatest player to ever do it. I'm moving. I'm moving to Los Angeles. I am a Laker. I am I'm definitely a Laker. I feel it. And uh, I'm happy as hell to be one. You know, I'm at a point now where I, I know what I'm here for, and I'm just trying to use, you know, my knowledge and use my position of power to be able to influence. For me to be a Los Angeles Laker and play inside Staples Center, to see all that purple and gold, for us to be able to, um, you know, play the game that we love, I mean, it's a beautiful thing. It's, it's not much more that you can ask for. For me, personally, being a basketball player, I'm chasing that greatness. That's always been my goal since I got in the NBA. James lost it, gets it back. James holding his left leg. Tried to stretch it a little bit, then limped back to the locker room. The Lakers now without LeBron James. And limped off the court. He hasn't missed a game this season. How do you think this season will be remembered for the Lakers? It's a lost season. Ball hurt himself. Grabbing onto his, his leg. Oh, that's over now. You're really not sure what you got with the young guys. The rumor mill is a churning. Anthony Davis potentially landing with LA sometime in the near future. A player like this, I roll the dice and wait till the summer. What are the Lakers? I don't know what they were trying to do. You can't try to make the playoffs and develop your young guys. Clearly, we can't keep them all, but we're trying to sign a max guy this summer. Rob has work to do, Magic has work to do, and LeBron has work to do. Next year, we're not taking this nonsense. My only goal being here is to get the Lakers back to playing championship basketball and competing for a championship. That's my goal. Anthony Davis traded to the Los Angeles Lakers. What does that do for the balance of power out west? You got LeBron, you got AD, you're in the conversation. I think the most difficult part for me was just not knowing leave a city that I've been playing for for seven years and then get to play alongside um, you know, LeBron. Play for an organization that's all about winning. Um, well, forget winning, winning championships, you know, and, and that's the only goal. There's James, goes across the lane, lays it up, and lays it in, and there it is. He just became the third leading scorer in NBA history. Kobe Bryant, another milestone for the great LeBron James. I'm happy just to be in a, any conversation with Kobe Bean Bryant. As I got drafted, I still just admired him, you know, seeing what he was able to accomplish, winning championships, just admiring him for so many years. It's just too much. The story is just too much. Now I'm here in the Lakers uniform in Philadelphia. Kobe Bryant is, is dead at the age of 41 due to a helicopter crash near Calabasas, California, just north of Los Angeles. It's too soon. I mean, way too soon. This was the guy they grew up on, a true, iconic guy. Obviously, the NBA is reacting to this news as, as we are right now.
I look at this as a celebration tonight. Tonight, we celebrate the kid that came here at 18 years of age. Retired at 38 and became probably the best dad that we've seen over the last three years, man. So in the words of Kobe Bryant, Mamba out, but in the words of us, not forgotten. Live on, brother. Number 24 and number eight. Oh, he's a legend. Uh, legends never die. You know, we got to continue to push forward um, because that's what he wants us to do. Los Angeles, home of the greatest athlete in the world today, LeBron James, the king. LeBron James putting on the finishing touches. The game has been postponed between the Jazz and the Thunder tonight. Still awaiting official word from the league office as to exactly why they've determined not to play tonight. We've been reading about this, dealing with this, talking about this for the last two, three weeks. So it's finally hit our country. When I think about who's going to win the championship, what scared me about the guys going back to play is injuries. When LeBron sat down, what are the Lakers going to be able to do? This plague of racism, which comes at the same time as this pandemic, demands our attention. I can't breathe. This is systematic. Some of the injustice that we've been seeing is not OK. Would you like any water? We are living in a time now where conversations that are difficult but are necessary. The NBA and the NBPA released an update. The NBA returns July 30th in Orlando in a bubble. The rules are for everybody. If it's a championship, it's a championship. You go to play, you go to win. The moment, you know, there have been a couple moments since January 26th where we all felt it. Uh, that first game against Portland, Ugh. obviously, uh, the first time they wore these jerseys. Hey, LeBron, I, I wanted to know what it was like to go out there with Kobe, surely on your guys' mind and heart. And, um, and did you notice the moment early on when you were up 24 to 8 in the first quarter? Um, it was an honor. <clears throat> it's been an honor to just put on the Laker uniform, um, even before the passing um, uh, of the great Kobe Bryant. Um, and tonight was another one of those uh, moments uh, for myself, for this organization, for all the players that, that was able to wear those uniforms that he um, that, that was inspired by him and, and his mind and his creativity. Um, <clears throat> so to go out there and. Um, and, and one day removed from his birthday, um, and then his his day of 824 to be able to have a game on this day. Um, the stars aligned. Um, I did notice the, that we were up 24 to eight because I'm always trying to figure out what's going on throughout the course of the game. I'm always looking if we're up, if we're down, what's the team fouls and all of that nature. And when I looked up there and seen 24 to eight, I was like, okay, this is, uh, uh, he's here in the building. He's here in the building. He's here in the building. Lakers got themselves into quite the situation, down one in a game they had largely led with just 2.1 on the clock, and Denver looking like it was about to assert itself in these Western Conference Finals. For LA, there would only be one chance, one shot. So one shot, 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 so one shot. Rajon Rondo asked Frank Vogel if he could be the one to do the inbound. And as Rondo stood there on the sideline, a human computer just analyzing every matchup <laughs> currently on the floor, his eyes fell on AD. The two had played together in New Orleans, so Rajan knew just not how dangerous AD could be, but just how many years Davis had yearned to show it. A and boy, did he, once the ball got in his hands. On the move and wow, money. Now, for a few hours after the game... There was a lively internet debate on exactly what Mason Plumlee was doing on this play, calling for the switch when no one was screening him. But honestly, fixating on that is missing the point. Anthony Davis is a 6'10 center who, when given the chance to make the game winner 26 feet from the basket under absurd pressure, hit an absolutely beautiful clean three. Afterward, Rondo called it the biggest shot of AD's life so far. You know, right after AD did hit that shot last night, as he was running back to the bench, he yelled, Kobe, 
just like so many kids do after they hit an imaginary big game winner in their driveways. Of course, for Davis and the Lakers, that comes with so much more weight now. They have dedicated this postseason to Kobe's memory. And last night, we're even wearing their Kobe tribute black snakeskin-themed jerseys. Kobe, of course, wrote himself indelibly into the history books of the sport by coming up big in those big boy moments. Now, finally, Anthony Davis has the chance to try following in his footsteps. And so far, he is making the most of it. That's bullshit. That's like what is this shit becoming to? Uh, WW this old WWE ass shit. Like what the fuck, man? Just play fucking basketball, man. This old scripted ass shit, man. This nigga already on this super ass team, this super good ass team and shit. You know what I'm saying? And it's like the nigga can go wherever the fuck he wanna go, man. Yeah. It's just crazy, like, I don't understand that shit, like, just, like, what it did was childish anyway, that was some childish ass, why you gonna leave the team that you want rings with to go back to a team that you left from, you know what I'm saying, I just, I don't know man, like, damn, what the fuck is basketball gonna be called next, like, this shit getting just too scripted and yeah. shit, man. But it is WWE. Like that's that's w, that was WWE when like a motherfucker, man. Hey, somebody whoever gets the script is gonna make a lot of money when they find out who's gonna win each game. Yeah, when they gonna find it each game, this shit is bullshit. Mm -hmm. Like, man, these niggas is puppets on here, man. These little these NBA players, man, they puppets, man. I knew when John Cena was gonna host the Hes the ESPYS. I knew I knew there was going to be something. It was something related to uh, Kevin Love when he had the WWE belt, and he also he also brought that WWE belt onto, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Jimmy Kimmel. So now they have uh, some dude from the WWE hosting ESPN, basically showing that all of this is WWE because ESPN advertises WWE. Why is the WWE on ESPN? It's time to wake up. It's time to wake up. So, I'm going to break down this monologue. And he. this is essentially the Freemasons. This is uh, basically mocking of the masses. Clear mockery in plain sight. He, he's telling you the truth. And you, you have to be... Uh, you have to be really dumbed down to like if you're not able to see what uh the elites had him do the trash talk the gimmicks the heel turns and lebron james wearing ultimate warrior t-shirts the nba is basically professional wrestling when you were watching it back then did you wonder if it was real or or, or fake, I guess is how you would say it. <laughs> I would beat you up if you was here in person. Uh, no, re wrestling is not fake. It's predetermined. It's a difference. You know, right. we know what's going to happen. And it's, it's complicated. The best guys, you have to, it's not governed by how mean you are how cunning or how skilled you are. It's about can you emotionally get people to believe in your ideals? Last night, we began the show with the disappearance of Michael Jordan's father. Tonight, the worst fears have come true. James Jordan was found dead, the victim of an apparent murder. It was a very difficult moment for me, and somehow I just kept my head high and look at the, the good of it, you know, the, the time that I, you know, we used to spend and the education that he gave me. And I thought about all the things that he used to tell me, just turn a negative into a positive. And here I was dealing with him in that way. It was tough. Shaken by the death of his father, who had always been his closest advisor and supporter, his choice had now become clear. And soon, the world would know about it. When I lose uh, the 
sense of motivation and the sense of to prove something as a basketball player, uh, it's time for me to move away from the game of basketball. It was something that you know, my father and I talked about way before he passed. Uh, me retiring from basketball and then playing baseball. And the final year that we won the championship was like his biggest push to go and do it. No one could present a challenge for me at the time other than what my father was presenting to me, which was to go and play baseball. Following his father's advice, Michael would become a minor league baseball player. But more than just a diversion, his new pastime was part of an emotional journey. I think what baseball did for me was it gave me an opportunity to revisit all those moments that I had uh, with my father. And when I really thought about it, I said, who's here? You know, everything that he's taught me, everything that I accomplished was him. It took me a while to understand that. And once I understood it, I could accept it and deal with it. So it was a therapeutic experience for me. I guess it made me at peace with myself. But in March of 1995, he would leave baseball and return to Chicago. He was up at the very top, the most popular athlete in the world for eight, nine, ten years. He leaves the game and comes back stronger than ever. I don't think anyone in the history of sport has ever pulled off something like that. And the guy, uh, and he did it again somehow. Facing the Seattle Supersonics on the NBA's ultimate stage, his ultimate stage, ultimate stage, he would remove any remaining doubts that he was the Michael Jordan of old. Michael Jordan is in another time, in another space, on another plateau. And as he led Chicago to victory over Seattle, Michael's comeback was now complete. And for the fourth time in six years, Jordan rules. After a two-year absence, the Chicago Bulls have regained the NBA throne. It marked the culmination of a journey that had begun with his retirement. Fittingly and symbolically, it had ended on Father's Day. I think it was a signal to some degree that he was there with me. It was a, a certain emotions that I couldn't really control, knowing that you know, the success of it was had something to do with him, you know, and, and that meant a lot to me. Michael, I know that the first one was sweet, but how much sweeter was this one? Well, you know, this, I can't even put it in words. My father said what it means to me. I know he's watching. This is for daddy. LeBron's decision. In this fall, I'm going to take my talents to South Beach and um, join the Miami Heat. Even if you don't know what you're going to do, what have you learned from the last time that you switched teams right. that will inform how you handle things this time? I mean, you, you learn from your mistakes. If I'm in that position again, I'll be able to handle it much better. That was LeBron James before the free agency circus that's consumed the NBA these past weeks. At the time, he promised me this decision wouldn't be anything like the decision back in 2010. Back then, there was the television special that earned the scorn of the nation. And this fall, I'm going to take my talents to South Beach and um, join the Miami Heat. And broke hearts all over Cleveland. This is terrible. This is the worst thing that could ever happen to Cleveland. I hope he never wins anything in Miami. But four years and two NBA titles later, a much more mature LeBron stuck to the different approach he'd promised. Instead of a TV extravaganza, a 952-word essay published in Sports Illustrated. And remember those gaudy predictions of multiple titles he made back when he came to Miami? Not two, not three, not four, not five. Not six, not seven. This time, LeBron was much more modest, writing, quote, I'm not promising a championship. We're not ready. No way. He also spoke from the heart, comparing his stint in Miami to going to college, noting, quote, these past four years helped raise me to who I am. It's a concept he'd spoken to me about earlier, 
Now, even though he was already 25 years old when he joined the Heat, it was his first time truly away from home. Even though I played for Cleveland for seven years, I still lived in my hometown of Akron. So I, I was in Akron for 25 straight years. And that's all I knew. I didn't know how difficult it was to learn new streets, learn new culture, learn new people, be around different things that I hadn't been around. And you know, it was very challenging for me. Now, he says, that growing up process is what made him finally understand his attachment and his responsibilities to the place he grew up. Cleveland fans haven't celebrated a championship in any major sport in 50 years. And his loyalty to them earned praise from many corners, even the White House. I think it's a, a pretty powerful statement about, uh, uh, about the value of, uh, of, of a place that you consider home. Yes, this time around, things are different. Back in 2010, Cavaliers owner Dan Gilbert posted a now infamous public letter to LeBron on the team's website, calling his departure, quote, a cowardly betrayal and shocking act of disloyalty. On Friday, well, Gilbert tweeted, my eight-year-old son said, Daddy, does this mean I can finally wear my LeBron jersey again? Yes, it does, son, he wrote. Yes, it does. <laughs> his injury faked now you might be saying to yourself i saw it happen i saw the achilles rupture i saw the brutality i saw the pain in kobe's face kobe bryant spent his formative years in another country country i still don't recognize the sovereignty of italy but he grew up playing basketball in italy playing soccer in italy and if we've learned anything about the athletes most known for acting for personal injury gain the Italians, they are a master class, master actors of showing what it means to seem injured for gain. But then I did a little bit more research. Who is the doctor that performed Kobe's surgery? Dr. Robert Clapper, that is his real name. I did do the research necessary to verify Dr. Robert Clapper's name. But some questions. Why would Kobe go to this specific doctor? Let's look into this specific doctor for further proof. He was a consultant on a show called ER. Hollywood Connections. Hollywood. A full-time doctor with time to consult on a television program? How would he have time? He has limbs to repair. He has hearts to mend. An orthopedic surgeon has all the time in the world suddenly unless it's a smokescreen, unless he's a medical facade. Where'd he go to school? You're probably saying, oh, well, he went to Harvard, Johns Hopkins, Stanford, Cal, Northwestern. Nope. Went to Columbia. I'm told it's a good school. They offered me a fellowship, turned it down. Columbia. Do I want a doctor operating on my Achilles tendon who attended the same school as the piano's Anna Paquin? Do I want Anna Paquin operating on me? The true blood here is the truth, which is splayed over all of us. Most of all, Kobe Bryant's reputation. He's better than this. He is a shining beacon brought down by Hollywood and it makes me sick. So the next time 
you see Kobe Bryant after his miraculous recovery on the court. Think about the truth, Shovel. <laughs> It's amazing to be standing here alongside Abby and Peyton. And, uh, you know, Abby decided to retire after a compelling World Cup victory. And, uh, Peyton hung, it up, hung up his cleats after yet another Super Bowl win. And so for me, you know, I tend to do things a little differently. So <laughs> I felt an impressive 17 for 65 season would be a bold statement to wrap up my 20 year career. <laughs> If you take his career and you divide it up basically in the numbers that he wore, he had two Hall of Fame careers, careers, careers. As you can see, I am not dead. This is a part of the Lakers story. Batman.